So I did not discover I had this talent. I always say memory is something that you have to be trained on. Like obviously some people we have like innate abilities to do like names and faces or numbers or something else. A lot of memory training is like sleeping enough and eating well. And I know it sounds super boring, but you don't have to like practice three to four hours a day. You can do like 20 minutes a day and it's enough. But as long as you sleep enough, and I can talk about this all day, it's there's so many negative things that happen when you're sleep deprived you're like more short tempered with your friends and family. You, there are so many small cognitive mistakes that you make and no one believes me when I say like, what if I told you you could rest more and study less in high school or college? And it just sounds really antithetical to like our society's values to say, if you rest more, you're gonna learn more. But it's true, if you rest more, you're gonna learn more. Yanja is a triple world record holding memory athlete and went from only just passing high school to becoming one of the 22 international grandmasters of memory. Today, Yanja and I talk about the art of memory training, her secret for sharpening her memory, and the one thing that drastically affects your memory. I'm Erica Kohlberg, this is Erica Taught Me, and today we're here with Yanja Wintersoul. So for people who don't know, what is a memory grandmaster? Ooh, a memory grandmaster is like a chess grandmaster, but way nerdier is what I usually say. So, you know, the intensity of chess championships, it's very similar in memory championships, but even more intense. It's like you have to memorize 6,000 binary digits in 30 minutes. You have to memorize a shuffle deck of cards as fast as possible. I think the person who did it the fastest did it in like 12 seconds or something. Yeah, 52 random what? cards. So they just see the cards, blah, 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 and memorize each number? Yeah, each card in 12 seconds. I'm slow, and I do it in 22 seconds. <laughs> I'm considered slow. Oh, my so, goodness. Yeah. yeah. So how did you first discover that you had this talent? So I did not discover I had this talent. I always say memory is something that you have to be trained on. Like obviously some people we have like innate abilities to do like names and faces or numbers or something else, but it's really a trained thing, sort of like learning how to read. Like you won't find like a year old child who can just learn how to read. You have to be like socialized into it. So in the same way I was socialized into learning about memory techniques and then I just got very competitive and I wanted to compete in it when I discovered the techniques. How long between when you first got interested in the memory techniques to when you became this champion? So I think I read it in, yeah, I, I read it and that I read a book about memory techniques called Moonwalking with Einstein. And in it, it's like an American journalist who tries to be the U.S. memory champion. And I read it and it really improved my ability to graduate from business school faster, basically. And so within a couple of months, I just attempted a memory championship in Germany. And I did terribly, but they were like, we give you the newcomer award. It was like a participation trophy. And I was like, still like, this is amazing. And then my first year, I ended up in first place for names and faces. I was one off from the world record at the time. So I think I memorized something like 185 names and faces in 15 minutes. And I think the world record was 186. So it took about a year uh, of training on and off. And then the next year, the following year, I went to Hong Kong for the Asian Memory Championships and I did 187. <laughs> so then I broke the record. And then after that, I broke it again for 212 names and faces in 15 minutes. And what are the three world records that you have? So it's 212 names and faces in 15 minutes. And then if you spell it just a little bit wrong, it counts as a mismemorization. The rules are very harsh. Uh, 145 words in five minutes and more than 400 images in five minutes. I have not been competing in a while, so I don't actually remember how many <laughs> images there were, but I would I want to say it's more than 400 images in five minutes. Was there a time when you decided to officially retire from it? I don't think I'm officially retired from it. I think I'm just like trying different things right now. Like we were talking before, like I'm interested in the World Series of Poker. I'm slightly interested in chess. I'm doing a lot of hackathons right now as a software engineer. So I think that's really interesting. Oh, that's so yeah. cool. But I might do memory again. It's really fun. I'm just very competitive. So any way I can compete and like destroy the playing field is really <laughs> fun for me. 
<laughs> to be honest. I love that you're so open about that. <laughs> I mean, some people are like, it's tacky. You should say you're doing it for like the liberation of women or something. I was like, it's numbers, dude. <laughs> it's fine. It's mostly for me. <laughs> yeah. How does the training process actually work? So when you decided, okay, let me, as my next challenge, set out to be the world champion in names and faces. How do you actually prep for that? So the way I prep for that is there are some training sites. And once you get into like the Facebook groups or the Telegram groups of these like memory championship training sites, there are some like standard training tools. But mostly I try to incorporate it into my daily life. So if somebody is like, oh, my name's Erica, then I try to think, oh, who does she remind me of? Does she remind me of someone called Erica? So it's more like playing games of association and doing the techniques on a day to day basis. But there is also like more complicated techniques that you have to read up on and practice every day. But honestly, a lot of a lot of memory training is like sleeping enough and eating well. And I know it sounds super boring, but you don't have to like practice three to four hours a day. You can do like 20 minutes a day and it's enough. But as long as you sleep enough and most of my students don't believe me when I say this, but they've done studies where people are shown like a bunch of cards and on the back of the card it says this is important this is not important and then the people who sleep on it they will remember the cards that said this is important to remember more than they will remember the other cards but the people who didn't sleep on it who had sleep deprivation they will remember a very low amount of both cards if that makes sense Wow. So your brain is sorting. I always say that sleeping is sort of like sorting your inbox very efficiently. But if you don't sleep, you just have like newsletters, spam, somebody who wants you to deposit money into their obviously fake email <laughs> and everything <laughs> like that. So I usually just say like if, if you never try any memory technique out, just the number one habit is sleeping. And what sleep habits do you have? Because one of my struggles is when I sleep, it's pretty nice, but I have so much. <laughs> when you sleep. Running. Yeah, when I sleep. I have so much in my mind and so much excitement. I get extra creative at night that yes. most of my ideas come at night. And I'm just like frantically typing away ideas or doing various things that sometimes, I mean, probably in the last two weeks, like there are four times I've stayed up till 4 a.m. working. Wow. And it's just because I, I love what I do and I get very, very excited That's at wonderful. night. That's wonderful. But then it does hurt. It hurts my sleep quality. It hurts me the next day because I don't feel as sharp. Yeah. What What could I do? What could you do? <laughs> <laughs> so this is very similar to, uh, I love this book, Mental Game of Poker by Jared Tendler and Barry Carter. And it talks about how you can have, you can start basically training your memory to associate certain habits with certain actions. So if you start saying like, when I'm in bed, I only sleep or I only read or do other things like that is just for specific activities. Then your brain starts to associate that with only that. And it's actually interesting that you say that you get really creative at night because that's what I tell most of my students is for more logical and structured things earlier in the day is better, but you have more of your creative ideas at night. What you can, what you can do is that you start having your wind down routine a little earlier and then you start letting yourself, giving yourself the space to say like, hey, Erica, you're going to have two hours to have like a creative like brainstorming session or whatever it is. And then you start kind of creating a routine so that your brain associates it with sleeping. So for me, it's like brushing my teeth, getting in my PJs, doing a skincare routine, et cetera. And then my brain starts to slowly think, oh, right, she does this when she's about to sleep. So then I have like the space to do the creative part. And then I also have the little routine that like signals to my brain that it's about to be time to sleep. Do you think it's important to have a digital detox at that time? Yes. So I usually say like if you have an iPhone, click it three times so you get the red screen so that you don't have blue light because the blue light really makes us feel like it's still time to be up. And, you know, as a Swede, you have to be very careful about the light regulation because your brain starts thinking, oh, well, it's still out the sun's still out. It's 2 a.m. I should still be doing things. And it's very hard to not be productive. But you do need that rest. Regardless of where we are in the world, we need that, honestly, probably nine hours of sleep. <laughs> wow. Yes. Is that, that is, how much you aim to get every night? I try to. Nowadays, things are quite busy. But if I were competing, I definitely do more than nine hours, if I'm being honest. 
The night before a competition, is it hard for you to get to sleep? Like if you're going on a competition or a big TV show, do you get that anxiety and it's hard? I to do. Get- I do. I, I do get anxious <laughs> and I do get excited and I'm like, and then she's going to ask me this and then I'm going to answer like this and it never pans out that way. So it's a total waste of time. But uh, I usually try to arrive at the place like one night before. So two nights before, because the first night your brain is subconsciously a little stressed. So you're not actually getting rest. The first night at a new place, like a hotel, your brain is a little bit on edge, kind of like half asleep. Um, And then the second night you can usually get a better night's rest. So that's a hard lesson I learned very early on is you want to arrive there so that by competition day one, you've already slept at the venue or not at the venue, but a hotel close to the venue two nights in a row. Mm. So there's a lot of these like sleep techniques and a book recommendation for that is Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker. So good. I love, love, love sleep. (laughs) I feel like I'm more of a sleeping champion than a memory (laughs) champion. I have so much advice on sleep. But can you tell very concretely that when you get six hours of sleep versus nine hours oh yeah the day after or is it is it the following day is it the day after directly or the following day after that it impacts your memory it impacts your memory like even the day after like if you sleep six hours it's gonna even if you can't consciously feel it it impacts your performance and they there's sleep laboratories and sleep studies on this even if you feel like you're getting enough rest at six hours it's like night and day, like literally, but yeah. six to 12 hours, that's a huge difference. And I know from talking to like tennis champions and poker champions and, and, and chess champions, like a lot of these champions performing at a high level that when you're doing it, like high intensity mental activity, even if it's a physical one, you do need more sleep. You do need more calories. Like you do need more rest. And it's just, it doesn't sound good to go on TV and say, I I sleep 12 hours when I have a chess championship, you know, but that's the truth is like, if you're really in that headspace, you need more rest. And I think it's, our culture doesn't really allow for it, but as much as possible. Yeah. It's funny that our culture, I feel like shames that it, like getting lots of sleep is equated to being lazy, which is not true. It makes you more productive. But for whatever reason, like people don't brag about, oh, I got 12 hours of sleep. No, at the law firm, at least where I was, yeah. they'll brag about like, oh, I pulled an all nighter closing that deal. Like <laughs> that's, the, that's yeah. the way they brag. That's the trophy. That's like the humble brag. Yeah. And it's not it's not good. And like, I mean, I can talk about this all day. It's there's so many negative things that happen when you're sleep deprived. You're like more short tempered with your friends and family. You, there are so many small cognitive mistakes that you make. And I know this from working with so many students is when they get their sleep in order, like their life changes. And no one believes me when I say like, what if I told you you could rest more and study less in high school or college? And no one believes me because it sounds ludicrous to be like, You can be kind to yourself and learn more, but it's true. When we're sleeping, your brain is sorting all this information, kind of trying to untangle all of this mess that you're trying to like shove into your brain. And it just sounds really antithetical to like our society's values to say, if you rest more, you're going to learn more. But it's true. If you rest more, you're going to learn more. I always say that one of the greatest pleasures of quitting my nine to five is as much as possible, I don't set an alarm clock in the morning. Yeah. Like that is one of the greatest gifts because then like I wake up when my body feels like waking up. Whereas my entire career, my entire schooling, like everything, there was always an alarm in the the morning that woke me up. And that may not necessarily have been when my body wanted to wake up, but I just love that. Like I will not schedule meetings in the morning because I want to be able to sleep in and just wake up naturally. And that's also a huge part of autonomy, I think, as well. Like, we want to feel autonomous as human beings. And then when society is like, you have to be at the office at 8 a.m., whether we have our dream jobs or not, we don't <laughs> want to be We don't want to be told where to be at 8 a.m., I think. Yeah. yeah. I'm really excited that you're, like, ex- <laughs> I'm, like, s- selfishly asking all of these questions that I need to know because that's one of the things that I've identified is just, I'm not good to myself. Like I'm not good to my body. Mm. To me, working like 16 hours a day was so normal at the law firm Mm. that it's very hard to train myself to not not associate 16 hours of work as like a good work day. I'd rather honestly have six hours of very productive work than 16 hours of like kind of doing 10 different tasks and 
But it's hard. It's hard to undo that training that I've had in the corporate world. I think it is really hard. And I think one one thing that I try to say to myself, because now I'm currently in the corporate world, is that scientifically, I feel like we can have at most three blocks of 90 minutes of focus. And otherwise, we just we just fuse out. We just flame out, especially because we're so addicted to all these like little dopamine machines and in, in the forms of like phones and social media. And so we are all doing like 100 things at like 50 percent capacity. But it would be better if we just said like, hey, OK, I have 90 minutes to work on a script or I have 90 minutes to edit a clip or I have 90 minutes to plan my social media for the week, whatever it is. And then also take those breaks because it's in those breaks that we come up with better ideas for the next chunk of time. It is really hard to unlearn, especially in a society that is so like more is more. <laughs> <laughs> but I think having that in mind of not seeing yourself as better than the world's best researchers mm -hmm. and admitting to yourself, like they say you can be in flow state for X amount of time. And for most people, that's going to be at most 90 minutes at a time, three times a day. And then we kind of want to just chill. Like we used to not work as hard as we do today. And I try to keep that in mind, even in my job, that I can do 90 minutes of coding. I can do 90 minutes of meetings. I can do 90 minutes of ideating on, an, on a feature. Um, but most of the time I need like some downtime and not associate that with associate breaks and taking care of myself as something antithetical to like. Yeah. So if you had a client come to you and say like, create the perfect day for me, uh. the perfect day and night <laughs> that would maximize my productivity and my brain power, what would it look like? That's a really good question. I think it really is person specific. But for me, I'd say I would it, it depends on the, if they have a nine to five. Right. But even if they have a nine to five to try to do 90 minutes before their normal job on something that they're interested in, whether it's a passion project or their side hustle to just have that fresh 90 minutes before work for themselves because that kind of shows your brain as well. You're kind of trying to train your entire system to say like, hey, my hours, my time is more important than whatever corporate or whatever other obligations I have. And then I would have a couple of blocks for work if I have jo a normal job or I would just like take a walk. I would honestly encourage most people to take walks more than they go to the gym because it's better for your brain and memory because there's a spatial aspect to it. Thing versus being on a treadmill versus being on a treadmill yeah it's it, I think it's better for your heart I think it's better for your memory to take walks and sometimes take walks without listening to anything in your headphones and for eating that that's a little complicated but and also very person specific but eating at least twice a day very good and then at night I would say try to try to really schedule time that's not scheduled because I think when we're like playful and aren't focused to 100%, that's when really interesting things happen. And I find that with the most successful people, it is very hard to tell them to not do anything <laughs> for 90 minutes. And, and, and sometimes I will try to do something, like kind of trick them. I'll say like, go do breath work or go to the specific yoga thing. Because then it's kind of like doing nothing, but it still feels productive. But honestly, just staring into the ceiling and like, see what's up. What are you hiding from that you're being so productive for, you know, things like that. And then for the creativity part, again, 30 minutes, like more than 30 minutes before you're about to sleep, take that time to do the creative stuff. Because I think the most creative things happen right before sleep. But again, I would leave a little bit of space so that you can have a sleep routine. But it's just so hard because when I do get into that creative zone, it's like I don't want to leave. It. Like know. if I'm thinking about all these good script ideas, I'm just like frantically writing it down. And it doesn't matter if it's midnight or 1 a.m. or 2 a.m. Like I won't stop. And then I'll try to go to sleep and I'll relax. And then another idea will come into my head. And I know because uh, sometimes before I used to be like, OK, whatever, I'll write it down in the morning. And then it doesn't I, come back. And then I don't remember it in the morning. Yeah. So I know I have to like go find my phone again, uh -huh. put it up and then type the idea in. So what I do for that is I, I just have a pen with a little light on <laughs> oh. and then a physical notebook because then you're not distracted by your phone. And what happens is when we have our phones present, 
our brains are constantly thinking about what else exists within the realm of our phones. So even if you're just making a note like, I should do this for a script, you're subconsciously still thinking about your Twitter feed, your Instagram feed, whatever it is. So I usually try to say like, just have that physical block, like that yeah. notebook and like a little pen with a little light on it. So you're not, and preferably like warmer light if you can manage it, because then you're not so distracted, like subconsciously distracted and thinking about everything that exists on your phone. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> these are so actionable. Like I, I'm actually going to apply these. I hope you do. And another thing I would say that's really hard for especially teenagers and people in college um, is take your phone out of the room when you're studying. And I know it sounds like so basic, but it's they've shown that just the presence of your phone on your body or in the same room, even if it's off, it distracts you from performing at your highest so if you can just put that phone away <laughs> for yeah. that 90-minute block or in the beginning, it's not going to be a 90-minute block because you're not, you're not used to studying for so long. So it's going to be like a 30-minute block. But just putting it away, it's going to make you that much more focused. They have these devices where you can – it's like a Tupperware box and you can lock your phone in it for a set amount of time. I, I bought it. <laughs> Does it work? <laughs> it worked when I wanted to use it, but then it, it gives me anxiety too because I'm like, okay, what if there's a, a fire alarm or something while the, my phone is locked? Like, yeah. Gonna... And that's when I do a lot of like reflective behavior. Like did the world end because I focused on this task at hand and put my phone in the Tupperware box in the other room? And usually the world doesn't end. Sometimes you miss like an important message, <laughs> but, but mostly it's fine. And I think it's just a matter of being very present. And that's a really hard aspect of memory training. Like at the end of the day, memory training is about mindfulness training and reflection. So you're trying to reflect on what you just experienced, but you're also trying to be very mindful about what you're doing right now. And that includes being present enough to not have your phone on you when you're doing the one task at hand. But it also includes being reflective about, hey, did the world end while I had my phone in another room? Oh, no, it didn't. You know? <laughs> I hope. I hope. I don't want to be responsible for no. if the world ends because Erica didn't look at her phone. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing these days to maintain your memory? Are you still doing exercises every single day? I do not do exercises every single day. I think I do them subconsciously. So you know how I describe memory training as something that is a learned behavior, a learned skill, sort of like learning how to read. Once you learn how to read, you can kind of not, it's kind of hard to forget, right? Because yeah. it's, so, it's everywhere. So I find use for it every single day of my life. And I find that I do it con subconsciously all the time. So I, I, just like when you're reading, you don't need to like spell out, hopefully you don't need to spell out and voice out every single letter. In the same way, I'll see like a six digit, password that is unnecessarily long <laughs> and digit rich and I will still be able to automatically remember it without trying very hard. So I don't really do a lot of memory training day to day because once you've learned it and once it's ingrained, you kind of do the techniques naturally. Oh. Yeah. Do you memorize your passwords or are you like us normal people who have to like <laughs> write it down in 10 different places? So I use like a password algorithm. And what I mean by that is I have a technique that I apply to every single website and it's uncrackable, hopefully, because it's something specific to me. So it's kind of rules that I set for each website. And then it's long. It fulfills all of the extreme criteria that we have with password requirements nowadays. Um, so I don't need to memorize it because I know kind of the rule that I have for the password. I think I've seen someone talk about this. It's basically like the first three letters are going to be the street that you were born on or something like that. Like they're associated to you. But yeah. Is that what it is? Yeah. So you make a rule where you can say like the street that you were born on and then maybe the first digits of whatever address of the university mm -hmm. you graduated from and then and your ex-boyfriend's and then your ex-boyfriend's birthday, ex <laughs> birthday <laughs> whatever it is so you have like an algorithm you have like a system and then based on the site let's say it's facebook and let's say it's i use facebook for social media then i maybe have a system to write social media so you have like little rules but the rules have to be specific to you and hopefully you don't share it and hopefully no one can figure out that it's you're the street you were born in, the university address, and your ex-boyfriend's pet's <laughs> birthday, and then what you use the app for. So little algorithms like that are more helpful than trying to memorize something incredibly convoluted. Interesting. Yeah. 
I know that you have a lot of clients who come to you and say, I want to improve my memory or I want to achieve this specific thing. What's kind of the most common request that you're getting? Is it that the CEOs that come and say, I want to memorize 200 names of my employees or? Yeah, that is a common one. And usually that is a common one. It's a, it's a harder one because it is about spending some time. It's not just about it's not just about something I would call explicit versus implicit memory. So explicit memory is when you kind of wrote, mem- not wrote memorized, but you kind of n- like a fact about the world. Like this is the biggest lake in Russia or whatever it is. So in the same way, you kind of explicitly learn all of the people that are the 200 new hires of your big company, right? But I usually encourage them to try to do more ex- like implicit. So that means getting more into the feel of it, getting to actually know them, because then that in that way, you're going to actually remember their names better than if you're just trying to memorize a list of 200 people. Now, I can teach you how to do that, too, Mm -hmm. but there's a nicer way to do it. So that's a common request. A bigger common request is more overall memory improvement for work life. And that one is very hard (laughs) to teach for people who don't get enough sleep or don't exercise or don't eat well. But I think What's interesting is the most common ones, it it usually is about human relation. Like, how do I remember what people tell me when we're at a dinner? How do I remember people's names and faces when we're at an important event? And then I usually ask them, why not memorize people's names and faces at an unimportant event? (laughs) You know, (laughs) like you can get practice anywhere. So those are some common ones. Actors trying to memorize lines for very big and meaty monologues. There's, There's a lot of different um requests but in general i would just say at the heart of it it's you're trying to make life more memorable so if they come to you and say my goal is to be able to memorize the names and faces and event important events for these people at important events what is the first step you take them on so the first step is attention So you want to be paying attention to what people are saying. And everyone finds this very condescending when I say it. But usually when you're shaking hands with someone at an event, your your mind is racing with a lot of things. You might have social anxiety. You might be thinking, are they taller than me? Are they smaller than me? What's happening? What's their breath like? You're thinking about so many things that you're barely listening to what their name is. I've noticed it in myself that I'm like concerned about whether I'm going to get my own name right, (laughs) even though I shouldn't be. And then what I say is usually pay attention. And then the second part is bridge. So bridge is like make a mental bridge between what you know about this person and what you already know. So a lot of memory techniques is about creating kind of like these bridges and these connections between what you already know and what you want to know. So if somebody says, hey, my name is Rodrigo, that might sound very random to me. Or I might think of my favorite Brazilian actor, Rodrigo Santoro. And then suddenly now I'm creating a bridge between this Rodrigo at this important event and Rodrigo Santoro, amazingly hot actor from Westworld. (laughs) And so then I'm suddenly way more interested in remembering this name, but I'm also like adding it to my already existing kind of database of knowledge. So the more you try to tie it to things that you already know, the easier it is. And then C is kind of connection. So you want to create a connection that feels natural and, and, and that you care about. So ABCs of memory is like attention, bridge, connection, attention, bridge, creativity. So you want to also make it quite creative. So Rodrigo from Westworld feels creative already, but it might be that their name is Rose. And then you want to imagine, ooh, do they smell like roses? Mm-hmm. Is, do they have a nose that's shaped like a rose? There's so many things you can do with that. And whatever comes to mind, you don't have to share it with the person, mm-hmm. but you can just make those associations by yourself. So that's usually my very go-to tips, like attention, bridge, and creativity. But it's really hard to do in the moment, and it takes a bit of practice. But usually it goes way better that way than just trying to say the name over and over again to themselves. And also, that is a big thing that I will tell people don't do that thing that's very salesperson-y where you're saying the person's name too much. Do it in your head. But like when I've just met someone in, so tell me, Yenja, where did you grow up? So Yenja, I'm like, I don't know you. <laughs> Why are you? And you can tell they're, they they're, watched that one podcast where it was like, repeat the person's name like, three times. Yeah, people love them. hearing their own names. I was like, no, because if you say it three times in one sentence and we've just met, I feel like I'm being sold something, you know? So you can say like, so where did you grow up? And then in your head, you can say Yenja. And then that will help you ingrain that memory better. 
but don't say it so much out loud <laughs> is what wow. I say. Oh, that's so good to know. I thought you were going to tell me the opposite. I thought you were going to say, like, make sure you repeat their name again a few times as you're speaking to oh, them. Oh, no. Oh, no. No. So you just I, say it in your head. So I say it in my head because that feels more natural than saying it over and over again in person. And obviously, like, when you're saying bye, if you have the opportunity to say bye, then you can be like, oh, it was very nice meeting you. I like, oh, hope we keep in touch, et cetera, et cetera. But I would say, again, with the reflection part, after the event, I do spend a little bit of time, if I can, reflecting on what I experienced. Like, who did I talk to? What was their name? What's their wife like? What are their kids like? What what do they seem interested in? So like that reflection, we barely have that nowadays because nowadays we kind of confuse consuming information with knowledge. So we're just like going through a news feed and like bookmarking all these things. And we're like, oh, I've collected information, but it's not really how memory works. And we say hi to all these people. And then we're like, oh, I got it down, even though we know our memories are not that good. Mm -hmm. So afterward, if I'm in the cab or if I'm on the train, I try to think a little bit more about the people that I met and what I can remember from meeting them. Yeah. And one of the things I learned, too, I remember when I was in high school, I interned for this doctor. And in these fields where person-to-person -person relations is very important, it's so important for these doctors to remember a lot of details about each patient, not just like what medical conditions they have, but what their dog's name is and all of these things. And I learned from him that he used to have this file of each of his patients. And every time they would tell him something like, oh, my dog's name is this and its birthday is this. After they left, he would write it down. Oh, interesting. Because it's hard to remember all of those details, but it's very important for that connection to have that, right? So then the next time the patient comes in, it's like, oh, how is Bobo doing? Yeah. And, and then, it's not that he memorized it. He, he just wrote it down after. <laughs> That's really good. That is like, even if he didn't memorize it and even if he doesn't have that information readily available in his mind, writing it down by hand is actually one of the biggest tips. All my, all my advice sounds so simple, but it's not easy to do. So writing it down by hand and a lot of teenagers fight me on this, <laughs> but <laughs> writing things down by hand after the fact is 42% better than if you type it out with a phone or on a keyboard. Because this tactile, this, this spatial information of using your hand is much more effective for ingraining memories. And the slowness makes you have to actually be reflective. Whereas when you're typing it out, you're more transcribing. So it's again, this like consumption versus transcription. And again, knowledge versus actually feeling it out and reflecting on what you experienced. So that's, he was subconsciously also doing a memory technique. Yeah, well, and I remember in law school, some of the smartest people I knew, they didn't bring their computers to class. They just brought a notebook. And another thing I realized is you also, whereas you can type however many words per minute, you can't write that quickly. So you just have to be super selective about the information that you are putting on that paper. Exactly, that is exactly how the, the technique works is you have to sort it out so you're already sorting it in your mind when you're writing it out. When you're typing, you're basically more close to transcribing. Yeah. Yeah. Does that mean that someone's a visual learner? For me, for example, like if I meet someone with a difficult name, sometimes I ask them to write it down for me right then so I can just see how it's spelled out. But I wonder if that's also because I'm visual. Like I'm now that I see Yenja on my on my paper, I'm more likely to remember it. Yes. Yeah, so this is a huge debate um, because people come to me and they tell me, oh, I'm an auditory learner. I'm a this type of learner. And I say like the strongest, our strongest sense probably after smell is visual. Most of the time we're going to, unless we're visually impaired, then like auditory will be very strong. But for most of us, vision is really, really huge. Like anything, most of the memory techniques have a lot to do with creating visual stimulus where there is none so remember how I said like oh imagine that her name is Rose and her nose looks like a rose you're trying to kind of effect, like kind of hijack and like game your own senses and when you use visual stimuli your brain is that much more likely to remember it so I know a lot of people will say my name wrong because they see how it's spelled and they have an idea of how it's pronounced. Mm -hmm. But then I will just write it out in a different way, the way it would be it more sounds, normal to yeah. pronounce it. And then, then they will get it because, again, visual stimuli is so, so, so effective. Yeah. You know, I was watching a lot of your past interviews and TV shows and everything yesterday. And I was like, the one thing I can't do on this podcast is mess up her name. But so <laughs> I, used, I used one of your memory techniques. For your name, you know what I did? So yen is the Japanese yen. I'm half Japanese, you know. 
And then ja is kind of a word we use in Japanese, like ja ne, or uh, yeah. it, it, means, <laughs> know, ja. it means kind of like, yeah, yeah, it means kind of like, uh, uh, it's kind like, of like, well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, actually, yeah, yeah it's well, more actually, like, yeah. so I just put, I put yen and ja together. And then I visually, you were talking in your YouTube videos about how it's important to see it too. You, you spoke about this memory maze. Mm -hmm. So in my mind, I was like, okay, let me pretend there's a yen, a coin on my hand. And then I'm just being like, ja, and just handing <laughs> it to you. <laughs> and is it that, works. Is that what you would have done? That is what I would do. <laughs> yeah. It, like Erica is like in Swedish, that would be like, Ia is like a slangy way to say is. Rik is like rich. So is Erica rich? Based on her TikTok videos, I would say probably yes. <laughs> and then it's easier for me to remember than if I'm just like, just say Erica a bunch of times. Because that's like how we're taught in school, right? Just yeah. say it a bunch of times. No creativity, no visual stimulus, no ABCs. It's just like, just say it a bunch of times. That works. It's like, but it's not a very sustainable method. No. And it's boring. But how are you doing that then when you're... There was this one TV show where they asked you, the audience revealed their names, mm -hmm. and then you had a, just a few seconds to take a look at all of the names. I think it was two rows of people, and then you memorized every single name. And sure enough, like you got it all right. How do you do that? I understand how I did it for Yenja when I had to, I had all night to remember <laughs> it. But yes. Like, <laughs> but how do you do it when you have, you're under so much pressure and have so little time to memorize that? Oh, so one thing I try to do for TV based on experience is that I try to do fewer than I, I try to pick a safe amount, like set a safe amount of people, a safe amount of time. And what happens is it's, it's again, like reading, like once you get used to seeing a name and then immediately making all of these creative associations and then kind of reflecting on it, you start speeding that process up. So the first time you're learning a new language or the first time you're reading, you're sounding everything out. You're like, E-R-I-C-A, Erisa. And it's like, no, it's Erica. And once you get really used to that, it goes faster and faster to the point where in the beginning, memorizing 100 digits in general sounds amazing. But then as I was telling you before, at the highest levels, people can memorize 100 digits in 20 seconds because they just get used to reading digits almost as if they're letters. <laughs> so that's how I do it is I, I try to I try to chunk it I, and also the more the more I get used to it the easier it is so I'm sure people ask you this all the time like some of these things that you're memorizing the names and faces that's very practical that's very useful in your day-to-day -day life the numbers memorizing 200 numbers in a row that's not so <laughs> practical no but one thing that I saw that you are very good at is languages like you've used the your memory to be able to learn many different languages right. how is does that work the same way? So I think I talk about this a little bit when I tried to memorize 3,000 Brazilian Portuguese words in three weeks. And it was hard. But again, it goes back to very basic pr principles of like ABCs of memory, like attention, bridge, creativity. So in the same way, if I see a new word that I want to learn, if it doesn't come to me naturally, this is what I say. If, if there's a natural way you can learn that word, then just let it be. But if you stumble upon it and you've noticed that it's very hard for you to learn it, then start incorporating those techniques. So like, for example, lagos would mean lakes in Spanish. And because I speak English, I can just kind of think, okay, it's kind of like lakes, but with a G sound in it. And then that's how I associate it. But then the further away you are from that language, meaning whatever language you speak and the language that you're trying to learn, the difference, if there's a huge difference, sometimes it can be harder and you can have to kind of break each word down. Okay, so for example, Juanhet in Swedish is beautiful or beauty. And so Juan, it means kind of soft, nice. Het means hot. So that's one way. If you know both of those words separately, you can just be like, oh, it's a it's a beauty that's kind of like soft and hot at the same time. But if you don't know those words separately and you're just kind of being flung into learning Swedish, then you want to associate it with words that you know in your first language or your native language. So it might be Kwanhiet. I don't I, it's very hard <laughs> to think of it because it's my first language. But maybe it's like, um, I don't know. I, do you have an example for a word that you want to learn in Swedish that's hard to remember? Taksumiket. Oh, yeah, the way Taksumike is like, <laughs> you know that one. It took me a long time to learn it. <laughs> yeah, I think it's What's a flower? Flower. Okay, so flower is blumma. So 
it that, blooms. It blooms. Yeah. So see, like the longer you get used to, the more you get used to memory techniques, the more it comes naturally to be like, oh, it blooms. What's leaf? Leaf is blod. So that also sounds like bloom. But I would say it's like um, odd. Like, oh, there's an odd amount of leaves. So then you go blod, it blooms, and it's odd. It's the odd one out of this vase. And sometimes the associations are very like far-fetched but as long as you make those associations it'll be easier for you to remember than just trying to learn it by rote and how long can these things stay in your memory like i saw one time you memorized the entire ikea 2018 catalog if i set a page would you still remember it or at oh, some no. point you no got rid of it absolutely not <laughs> <laughs> i i love ikea <laughs> it is the swedish rule but um i i don't love furniture enough to still remember even after like maybe a month or two after the campaign and the press conferences and everything were done we went to a store uh, me and my friends and they were like testing me and i could not remember anything and i think that's a big part of memory techniques as well as your brain starts getting better at sorting things that you don't need for the long term as well. So for being able to memorize for a longer term, it's about repeated exposure, but it's not about it's not about binging it. It's repeated exposure in certain intervals. So a lot of people think, oh, if I just like study this and say this word over and over again, I'm going to learn it. But what happens is your brain thinks, oh, this is just something she needs to know right now for this hour because she keeps saying it over and over again for this specific hour. But what's actually better is if you study that one word this hour and then in a couple of hours you come back to it, then your brain starts to go, oh, well, she needed it a couple of hours ago and now she needs it again. Maybe this is a long term thing. So it's about playing little mind games with your own brain. And then maybe after a couple of hours, you want to repeat it in the morning. And so you have like longer and longer stretches of time between each training session. And then your brain starts to go, oh, this is a long term memory thing. I get it. I get it. Because your brain is really trying to make you efficient. So anything that seems like you don't need it for the long term, it's just like throwing it out the window. But if you expose your brain to it in random intervals, then it's like, oh, it's, these intervals are random enough and they're far enough between each other that this must be important for long-term memory. And that's what happens with when we cram for a, a, an exam or whatever it is, is we do it only for that one night. And so our brains are like, oh, that was a one night only thing, you know? Yeah. But it's actually better to study consistently for a longer stretch of time because then we're like, oh, this is like something I need to know for a long time, you know? <laughs> so it's, it's just about trying to get your brain to be on your side and just kind of gamifying it in that way. See, I was gamifying in law school. I knew that I had a very good short-term memory. I had this ability to cram a lot of information wow. and then spit it out. So what I did for one class, I remember this, I shouldn't be proud of this. And I hope like parents <laughs> aren't watching and being like, oh, I hope my daughter becomes a lawyer like Eric one day because they're going to be <laughs> disgusted when they hear this. But for one class, I, I started going to class and then I was like, you know what? This isn't efficient for me to commute every day plus get dressed. That takes 30 minutes and then like <laughs> attend the class and the, the lecturer speaks quite slowly. So I have to be in there for <sighs> two hours. So I was like, you know what? I'm not going to go to class anymore. And at the end of the semester, like two weeks before the final exam, because in law school, your final exam determines 100% of your grade. There's no participation points. There's no like midterm quizzes. Uh, so two weeks before the final exam, I got all of the recordings of the lectures and just listened to them on 2x speed and then just did very well on the test. Yeah. And it was like, it's not great because I don't know how much of that course I remember still. Yeah. And it was funny because I met the teacher like two years later and and at this alumni event and he's like, I don't remember you. And I was like, oh yeah, I wonder it's why. I didn't participate. <laughs> I wasn't in class. He did not have he did not have repeated exposure but to it was your like, presence. For school, I like I like figuring out how to take advantage of the system. And for school, that was one way I discovered that I could take advantage of the system. That is like just cram last minute and and listen on 2x speed. But it, I'm sure it wasn't great for my memory. It's probably not great for your overall retention, but <laughs> But for gaming the system, I'm really down for that, to be honest. <laughs> so that's why I learned memory techniques. Everybody thinks, a lot of people think that I'm a Ravenclaw, somebody who is very studious, had perfect grades. Several times journalists have been like, I've said I almost didn't graduate high school. I almost didn't graduate middle school. I almost didn't graduate college. And they always tweak my wording to be like, 
she occasionally struggled in school. But my, the people who studied with me, they saw my grades. They were like, it was a bloodbath. It was like all A's and F's everywhere. It was like I did the bare minimum to be able to graduate. And that's how memory techniques came into my life is I just wanted to study as little as humanly possible and still graduate from college. <laughs> like that was that was it. I just don't care so much about <laughs> studying. And you ended up graduating in two years instead of four, right? Yes, yes. So you're gamifying the system too. You're, yeah. <laughs> you're yeah, taking no, advantage I, I really, of the system. Yes, I really, really wanted to study as little as possible because it's it's the way we're meant to, the way we're told to study in school traditionally is so against human nature. And I just never liked it. I never respected this whole you have to memorize a bunch of things and then you go to an exam and then you show that you've memorized a bunch of things and God knows whether it's applicable to real life or not, you know? Yeah. And I still think that's true. Like there are huge conceptual things that were beautiful about business school. And there was a lot of just rote memorization that I don't know that I need today, like as a business person or just as a human being. Yeah, no, know? that to makes total sense. How much of you being this memory world champion was because you trained and put the time into training versus how much of it is like your natural ability, do you think? Like if I took a, if I took 10 people and said, here's a year to train, here are the best trainers in the world to teach you, would they all do well? I think nine out of 10 would do well because it, it really is about, like if, the, uh, <laughs> one of my favorite quotes is from that first memory book that I read, Moonwalking with Einstein. Uh, that every year there's a high chance that a student with an unstructured summer vacation <laughs> is going to sweep the floor. And that is very true because it's still nascent. It's new enough that you can still train in a year and become really, really good. As for myself, I think the names and faces, images and words, it did come naturally to me. I think I've always been fascinated with people who are good with words. I've always been fascinated with by names and faces obviously not to the extent where I could naturally memorize 212 names and faces in 15 minutes but I've always always appreciated getting to know people and I think it's also because my name is hard to pronounce and hard to memorize I've made extra sure of it growing up to like always say people's name right or always remember their names and always remember the words that they're saying and so that is more innate but I don't think anyone innately can memorize a shuffle deck of cards in 22 seconds. <laughs> that takes some training for sure. <laughs> yeah. Do a lot of these memory champions then go on to similar careers like coding or is everyone kind of all over the place? Oh, everyone is all over the place. Uh, one of the best. He is one of the best um, scientists, Britain neuroscientists right now in Holland. I, I'm guess globally when it comes to memory training um there are lawyers there are doctors there are people who are still fun employed it's very all over the place and i wouldn't say it's like oh you you need to have these attributes to be able to be a memory champion you just need 20 minutes to maximum 90 minutes a day and that's it i i, I think i do think like the ability to just sit and work on a problem and be focused is helpful for coding but i don't think necessarily everybody loves it so take me through the timeline. When did you decide to stop competing and go into coding full time? Yeah, I think at the World Memory Championships 2018, uh, there were things that I found a little bit unfair and I just felt a little burnt out. And so I stopped competing. And then like I had two things come to Netflix and then I had an opportunity a couple of opportunities with HBO and Spotify and all these things. And it just took too much time. So I just stopped. <laughs> and then the pandemic happened and my uncle, one of my uncles and a lot of other people have always said, like, you'd really love coding. You'd be very happy. And I am very happy coding. And so it's been really nice. And now that I found hackathons, I have an opportunity to code and be competitive. So it's been really nice. When did you start learning coding? 2020. So when the pandemic was starting to happen, I was going to like a prep class and then the pandemic happened and I was like, every single TV job just flew out the window and then it was just time to learn how to code. So I learned how to code during lockdown. <laughs> Do you still have a passion for acting and comedy and all of those things that I know in 2016 or 2017, when I was watching those interviews of you, you were like, that's what I want to do. Oh yeah. I did. I did a lot of stand up. I did. 
I did do really well um, talking to directors and casting agents for acting. So it's a fun thing. I just don't, I, I still love it. I just don't know if that's all I want to do. And I'm all right with having a big range of things that I want to do because it, it's really, I, I don't think we all have to be niche down into like one specific thing. We're all so multifaceted and I think it's really fun. It doesn't have to be the main thing I do, but when somebody's like, hey, we're shooting a vampire thrill in the north of Sweden, do you want to be the bad guy? I'm like, yeah, okay, sure, you know. Um, I want to test your memory, though. Yes, I have a little do. game for us. Mm -hmm. Are you down for this? Yes. So is it a memory game? Yes, it's a memory <laughs> game. Because you're so good at memory and I am very into finance and credit cards, mm -hmm. I'd like to see if you can memorize this fake credit card number. OK, so don't memorize it at home, y'all. Yeah, it's fake. It's fake. I, I hope it's not someone's real number. <laughs> Oops. Okay. But as you know, a credit card is 16 digits and then it has an expiration date of the month and the year. So, okay. need. so I, I guess I should set a timer. Or how long do you, should I show you this? Uh, you can just show me it and I'll, okay. we can see, we can, we can play it back how long it took. I'm okay. going to try to play it safe. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to show it to the camera first. Okay. Are you ready? I think so. Um... Okay, we're well, okay. Uh four seven three six one seven eight four five nine zero four three six eight seven expiration date zero seven twenty six. Oh my gosh, you got it right. <laughs> So yeah, I, I I feel like I got it in a very short time, but then I wanted to make sure just for the podcast. Wow. Yeah. I'm like, <laughs> but I was anxious for you too, because if you were going to mess up, I was going to be like, no, we can do it again. But oh my gosh, that's incredible. We were joking earlier. Like it's a, it's a very good thing. You're not ethically challenged. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was telling you, I could also just like be a waitress and memorize credit cards if I wanted to yeah. go to the dark side. <laughs> wow. I'm so glad you're on the light side. <laughs> That's insane. I want to ask you, as you were memorizing, I heard you saying some words out loud and then moving your hands. Like, mm -hmm. what were you doing? So I was using the memory palace technique. You can check it out on my YouTube channel. You can check it out on any of the things I've been on because I talk about it a lot. Basically, you're using your ability to navigate spatial environments to place little objects. So every three digits for me is an image. So I have, for example, Reem is like this producer in Sweden uh, that I worked with once. And so I'm placing her on a stove and then so Reem is three, seven, or four, seven, three. <laughs> and then Bill is like a check, like a bill is six, one, seven. Um, and so I've made a little bit of a letter to number system. And you can also check that out on my YouTube channel. I talk about it a lot. So I'm just imagining this woman on a stove holding a bill being like, let's go. And then the next one was Voss Gård. So it was a vase in Swedish and then Al Gore. So I'm just imagining a vase that's like getting smashed on Al Gore on my bookshelf. And then I'm imagining on a chair, I was seeing a mafia. So three, six, eight was mafia. And then seven, two, six is Leben, which is a German word. And so I was just kind of like imagining something Germanic there. And so you're kind of using spatial memory and also creativity again to kind of associate it. And it takes a bit of time. For most people, it's better to have like one image for every two digits instead of one image for every three digits. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and that's that's how I do it. It's just a lot of creativity. So instead of boring numbers that I would have to just say over and over again, I'm imagining like a fun story because we're naturally storytelling machines. It's easier for me to imagine like this producer with a bill and then smashing a vase against Al Gore and then, you know, 
just a mafia that's associated with Germany somehow on my kitchen table. And then I'm using spatial information and I'm using creativity and connections and paying attention. Wow. <laughs> and anyone can do this. It's 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 always hard for me to be like pumped about it. <laughs> and I think there's even a clip of me on one of the Netflix things where I've memorized like 500 digits and in the studio I'm like, yeah. <laughs> Everyone's applauding and I'm like, yeah. Ta-da. I'm so pumped for you. I was like, my heart was beating so hard as you were going through it. I'm like, oh, she's getting it right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, everyone can do it, really. Wow. That's why. That's why I have a course in it because I'm like, literally, everyone can do it. I promise you. It takes a bit of upfront memorization, obviously, because you yeah. have to create all these images. But after that, it saves you so much time. It's just like reading. Like you could never learn to read, or you could consume information faster by learning this little association technique. Because that's all it is. It's just like reading. Like, there's nothing in nature that says like the letter K has to be pronounced the way it's pronounced. But we learn to associate this shape with the sound. So in the same way, so in the same way, I see numbers, and then I know to associate that with certain images. Wow. Last question I have for you. So the podcast is called Erica Taught Me because I always like to teach my followers little tidbits of information that are <laughs> oh actionable. God. If we were to say, Yenja taught me. What would you want people walking away saying, Yenja taught me this? Yenja taught me that life is a game and being more playful and sleeping more is better for your memory. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Thank you so much. Where can people find you? People can find me at Yenja or Yenja W on most social medias. And if you want to do my course, you can go to worldclassmemory.com worldclassmemory.com. I love it. <laughs> Thank you very much. You so I love much for this. having me. This has been so cute. Oh. <laughs> If you enjoyed today's episode, check out Yanja's website in the show notes. And I have a huge favor to ask. It would mean a lot if you could take just a moment to leave a review for the podcast. Even one sentence is perfect. It really helps support the work that we're doing. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time with me today. And I'll talk to you next Tuesday on a brand new episode of Erica Taught Me.